This is honestly like one of those stories where it's um, it's it's one of those things where it's, it's going to be tricky to get through. Um, so we're starting to hear now from people who there are lawyers who are specifically authorized to visit uh, these centers and have access uh, to the kids. Um, we're starting to see more and more people speak out from having interaction with some of these kids and some of these uh, separated families. And um, this is hugely important. And, and, and we'll talk later in the program about the, the huge importance of just even like flight attendants saying to uh, their, you know, uh, their supervisor, I'm not working on a flight with these kids. I'm just not going to do it. And this is what, you know, very effective uh, pushback. So this is a physician who has been interviewed um, and actually given a little calm space almost in The New Yorker. Her name is Alicia Hart. She has worked as an emergency physician in South Texas for 10 years. She has seen a stream of migrant children from Guatemala and Honduras come to the U.S. fleeing gang violence. In the past, most of her kids in her care were teenagers who crossed the border unaccompanied, ended up in government detention facilities when they were 15, 16, 17, seemed capable of living away from their families, uh, most of them, according to Hart, were just waiting to be sent to relatives in the U.S. as they were being processed, okay? I think people can understand that as a unique circumstance. She says, the population I've been starting to see is younger, and it scares me. These are little people, little babies. They are ill-equipped to fend for themselves. They are so totally traumatized, they don't cry like normal kids. They don't interact like normal kids. She goes on to talk about this one kid, an eight-year-old, that she, um, who needed clearance for psychiatric treatment. The kid was surrounded by four escorts, one of whom was an armed police officer. Um... She walked over to the boy, she crouched down and asked him in Spanish, how do you feel? The boy had been custody for over a month. One of his guardians, these are one of the four uh, men, told me that he had been acting out and threatening to harm himself by jumping from his bed. She goes on to say, I couldn't find out any information from this guy because he would say, I'm not at liberty to tell you that and you don't need to know that. We're talking about an eight-year-old boy, Right. So she's trying to find out, like, how, how long has he been away from his parents? Where, where are his parents, et cetera, et cetera. She said, and he says, you don't need to know that. Even though a lot of my questions were relevant to taking care of the child, I was asking things like, where are his parents? And she says, uh, what bothers me is, if you know where this parent is, why can't we not contact them for consent? She's saying this to the other men. They aren't even made aware if their child has an injury, if their child is having a breakdown. These are people who are desperate for a better life and cross the border. Why are their parental rights being taken away? I asked the clinician. This is one of the guys who says they're in charge of the kid. When is this child going to be reunited with his parents? He was evasive. First it was, oh, well, we don't know. And then it was, well, he won't be reunited with his parents unless he behaves. The lack of compassion was scary, and it didn't seem like there was really a plan. This boy seemed devastated, quiet and withdrawn. He barely spoke. I asked him if he needed a hug. I kneeled down in front of the recliner, and this kid just threw himself into my arms and didn't let go. He cried, and I cried. And to think he's been in a facility for a month without a hug, away from his parents and scared, not knowing when he'll see them again or if he'll see them again. While I held him, I heard the man standing behind me muttering that I was, quote, rewarding his bad behavior. Thankfully, it was in English, so I don't think the boy understood what they were saying, but it just revealed their attitudes toward the kids. I referred the boy to an inpatient psychiatric unit for treatment. I worry that he may be treated with psychiatric drugs like antipsychotics, also without the consent of his parents. 
But I still believe that a psychiatric hospitalization is our best option. If we get these kids to the psychiatrist, at least they're in a protective unit away from these detention facilities where they will get some of the counseling they need because they've been through a tremendous trauma. There are now um, full-on confirmed reports, according to court documents, that show uh, many of these children have been drugged without any parental consent. Uh, this is so effing twisted. And uh, how do you deal with how twisted the situation is and remains? You know, Donald Trump can say that he signed this document. It's not clear what's going to happen in the future. Um, there, there seems to be no plan whatsoever to even keep records of where these children are going relative to their parents. And as twisted it is, is the this, this stories of, of these kids being drugged, essentially, without their parents' consent, these kids being holed up for a month plus, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, five-year-olds, toddlers, Babies, infants, without their parents. Um, how, do you, how do you look at yourself in the mirror? How do you tell yourself that this is okay? Particularly if it's your job to pretend that it's okay. What do you do? Well, here is um, a prime example of it. Here's how Brian Kilmeade deals with it. It wasn't President Trump's idea to have everyone leave from Central and South America in June and well up at the border. Somebody has to deal with this issue. It doesn't matter who the president is. Pause if it. you don't like his. Now, look, every summer this happens. And it happens because there is uh, horrors that m the vast majority of these people are trying to escape. And it's easier to make this trek during this time of the year. That's basically what it comes down to. I mean, if it was all about they're so compelled to come to the United States because of what we offer here, you wouldn't see this level of desperation coming just when they can actually make it. Right? Because it's like, you know, if you're going to go on a vacation, you just go on the vacation. But go. Somebody has to deal with this issue. It doesn't matter who the president is. If you don't like his policy, he's also trying open to your policy rather than just criticizing his. Pause it. He's trying Actually, there was a policy in place and there are multiple. There was a pilot program they shut down where they would release these people and have them in uh, close touch, I think they call it, where they contact them on a regular basis. And they had something like 97% of the people showed up for their hearings. 97%. And they shut that pilot program down, despite it showing its efficacy. Criticizing his, he's trying to send a message to the other countries. This is not the way you do it, because... This is a country that has rules and laws. The port of entry would be one thing. We can bolster those laws. But pause we just it, pause it. Incidentally, um, um, Chris Hayes tweeted out that Jared Kushner's failure to report on his federal disclosure forms is a federal felony. 91%. 91%. Of the people who were prosecuted under this new zero tolerance policy were charged with a misdemeanor. A misdemeanor. Jared Kushner, incidentally, has not been prosecuted for anything. And he certainly hasn't had his children taken from him. Entry would be one thing. We can bolster those laws, but we just can't let everybody in that wants to be here. And this is, these are not, like it or not, these aren't our kids. Show them compassion. But it's not like he's doing this to the people of Idaho or, uh, or, um, or uh, Texas. These are people from another country, and now people are saying that they're more important than people in our country. Pause it. Nobody's saying they're more important. All the data shows that immigrants, A, either increase employment for other people, or at, at the worst, have no impact 
on employment opportunities. B, they pay more in taxes than they get back in terms of services because they end up, whether it's under a fake uh, Social Security number, what, they pay the taxes so they don't flag themselves as being undocumented, and they certainly don't go and use uh, a, a wide range of services because they're afraid of being caught. So yeah. nobody's saying that they're more important. It's funny how kids in other countries are uh, innocent victims when they're trying to create a rationale for like airstrikes or military acts. Of and course. Then when they're trying to create a rationale for this, they're all of a sudden these like alien invaders. Of course. But how, honestly, how uh, sociopathic do you have to be to say, like, it's one thing if he was separating the kids from uh, their parents in Texas. Idaho? But, or Jesus. Idaho. Or uh, Texas. These are people from another country, and now people are saying that they're more important than people in our country who are paying taxes and who have needs as well. Yeah. Well, he just wants to make sure we vet who's coming across the border. And yeah. Uh, there's no way to vet these people at all, and uh, except for to separate them from the children. Unbelievable. All right. Um, you know, you know, you know, those uh, those 10 month old. We'll, we'll, sh we'll talk about this later. Those 10 month old. Um, those 10 month old uh, MS-13 uh, guys that they send back up. Got to be careful of those. It's not, not the, like nothing not like those eight year old uh, gang members. It's not like they're white children. Come on. You put those guys on, uh, yeah, Idaho of, of all places, right? <laughs> I'm from North Dakota, and even I think that's a really white state to reference. All right, we got to take a uh, quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking to Digby.